There's one question here from Patricia Church, and who's chair of philosophy at UCSD. Hi, I'm, I want to follow up Marja Banerjee's point because I, I think that, that you're not being imaginative enough in your response. Um, Marja's suggestion is not that you get the scientists to actually do this PR campaign, but that you hire a PR firm and you say, look, what we want to do <clears throat> is make available to the public the kind of story that Neil told and do it in a way that's persuasive. You guys are the ones who are supposed to be in the business of, of persuading people. Get the sound bites right, get the timing right, hit the right television shows. Bill Gates has provided $30 million to do this. We'll get, start you on $10 million. Let's go. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that what you really want to do is get the scientists to sort of timidly come out and say, well, you know, you really want to think about how the... Blah, blah, blah. That, that, we're not that great at it most of us. So give the job to people who know how to do it. I mean, if it re give it to professionals. Thank you. Uh, but, but I mean, if, it, if it's an economic matter, and I think that was the br one of the brilliant parts of Neil's talk, if it's an economic matter, I mean, there's a lot of people who care about the economic future of this country. So if it's an economic matter, get the PR company onto it. Uh, what? As my wife often reminds me, I, 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 most people don't give a hoot. I, 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 science, I mean, I think it's nice if someone gave us $30 billion, but I don't think, I think, it, well, you, TV stations march with their feet. I, I, I and other people like to try and do, get things, science on, on TV and, and other things. And the reason they're not on the, the reason, hold on a second, they're not on ABC and NBC and CBS is for the most part people figure there's not a lot of money to be made because and it would be nice to try and convince them otherwise, but for the moment, I think it's very difficult um, to try and get a lot of money on PR, on science, because it's not perceived by those people who are willing to spend the money as being a way to make money. Sorry, I, I don't mean to be tedious, so, but, but if I may just follow that up. Neil's point was that having a culture of ignorance as opposed to a culture of discovery is in the long run bad for economics. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And I think if that point can be got across in a way that's appealing, um, I, so, so I'm not necessarily talking about getting people to be more scientifically literate. I'm talking about getting them to see that science is in their yeah, economic interest. Yeah, I mean, I spoke interest. at the American Enterprise Institute, which is as conservative as it gets, because they recognize that this is indeed bad for, bad for the economy. But, but, um, but I think there are large-scale reasons why they don't particularly care if there's a large number of uneducated people. Um, I, I actually think that the presence of certain people in this room shows that people, some scientists and philosophers are actually pretty good communicators. So um, I'm delighted to have a chance to introduce Scott Atran. You had a question? Yes. Okay, could you just say who you are? Uh, Scott Atran from the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris. Um, there seems to be a conflation of two problems. The first is keeping non-scientific thoughts, irrational thoughts, out of science. Noble enterprise. The second is introducing science as a rational way of doing ethics and politics. Is there the slightest historical evidence whatsoever that the involvement of science in politics or ethics has done anything or could do anything to improve the human condition? I don't and think I anyone here has suggested that. I, I, your remark seems irrelevant to what's been said. There's no suggestion that we, no one has suggested that science provides a way of, of being more ethical or, or that it engages in politics. It tells suicide bombers, for example, that they're well. It may remove motivations for bad behavior, but it itself doesn't provide a moral. I mean, science doesn't provide a moral uh, uh, standard. It, it uh, has nothing to do with that. It may provide a way of uh, puncturing other uh, vicious moral standards. Well, except as a subset of enlightenment values of reason, of which science is a part, certainly there in the Jeffersonian sense, of course we want to apply reason to political decisions, uh, absolutely. 
So I think, I think there it's relevant. I don't think you, you shouldn't construe science narrowly in this sense because I mean, the way I look at it is we, when the stakes are high, we have a choice between conversation and violence, I mean, both interpersonally and at the level of nations. We have a choice between conversation and, or, and war, essentially. And what I see religious faith doing, what dogma does intrinsically and, and, and religious dogma especially, is it stops the conversation. I mean, dogma, dogma are those beliefs that you have taken off the table, that are no longer uh, there to be revised through, through new evidence and new argument. And these are the dogmas, these are the beliefs around which people are, are making their, their strongest claims about us, them, in-group, out-group, sort of tribalism. Um, and so I think the, the only thing that guarantees that our collaboration with one another is truly open-ended is a willingness to have our beliefs about the world and our behavior revised through conversation, and that is, that is science broadly construed. So you are advocating the introduction of reason and argument uh, into, human, into, into helping along human interactions into a more compassionate... Well, I think they started that several yeah, hundred years ago. That was the whole point of the Enlightenment. Yes. So hey, I, but wouldn't <clears throat> your own research, Scott, uh, on the psychology of terrorists, how to build a terrorist, yes. wouldn't that be applying science to understanding something that ultimately has political implications? Yes, of course. But... I'm just questioning the fact whether science should get involved in the, in the processes of political um, motivations and happenings. Okay, can it's, I just address that briefly? Yeah. Um, I had the, the honor of giving a tour of our new facility in New York, it was new six years ago, to um, Richard Holbrook, who was the, uh, shortly had finished his tour of duty as American ambassador to the United Nations. And he's a neighbor, so we, we did this for him. And I'm giving him, I'm showing him the moon and the planets and the stars and, you know, and he starts asking questions. And he says, well, is, uh, how much more is the effect of the moon being closer now that I just learned that it's an elliptical orbit on the tides? I said, oh, good point. There's a strong distance dependence on tide. And we, go, we start going around. And the stars, the some are red. It must be a temperature thing going on there. Yeah, some are cooler. And he starts asking these questions. And I'm saying, well, this guy just, just came out of the Balkans in, in conversations with the unrest over there. And he's asking me informed questions about the cosmos. And so I said to him, where does this come from? This is not just, where did this come from? And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. Actually, in college, I majored in physics. <laughs> Okay, and he switched his major like the last year or something. But he had his, this inculcation in sort of rational scientific thought that goes on in any physics curriculum. And I said, well, how, then I asked your question. And I said, has this worked in any one way or another, positively or negatively, in your negotiations, in your peace talks? And he said, I cannot imagine having accomplished what I did without that kind of thinking. Because, of course, in physics, you distill a problem to the, 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 its essence, find out that you shed what you don't need, look at what matters, and you discuss what matters. And when other people come in with their baggage, he cuts right through it and is able to, able to reach consensus in ways that others can't or can't even imagine. And so getting back to Steve's point, it's not so much that a law of physics gets invoked to solve an international problem, but certainly the training that goes on in the, in the mind of a scientist has got to be useful in solving problems, even interpersonal problems, more useful than not having that kind of background, well, uh, as, as so evidenced by at least this one uh, I agree with case. what you said, except for the last thing, interpersonal problems. I, I, uh, no, and not in a facetious way, either. Uh, um, you know, I agree with you completely. I, I think what we should really need to teach is process of science, is how, and, and that's what we try and do, and you know, certainly as I'm as chair of the physics department, that's what we try and do. But, but I'm a little worried about this notion that people are intrinsically rational. I don't think people are, are intrinsically rational. I mean, you, there's a rational component to humans, but I think we depend on our, most of us on our irrationality to get through every day. Uh, it, and maybe, you know, to be happy, you have to be delusional. I don't know. Maybe it will, science will discover that. If we discover that in order to be happy, you have to be delusional at some point in your life, are we going to say you shouldn't be delusional? I don't know. I, I think that the notion that, that rationality is... Um, is, is the central and major part of hum, human life is, is, is not at all clear when I look around Nobody the world. Said it's that. We're just we, saying it's, it's, it's our job essential to, try, to solving a debate. It's, it's, well, it's, it's very useful, and I think it's essential. I, I think it's an essential component, and it's our job to encourage it. But, but, uh, but I think we are fooling ourselves to think that 
that um, will ever live in a world that's completely rational. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I think there's, I think I, we should address this point because uh, there's a yawning chasm of uh, uh, nihilism waiting us if we don't uh, 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 seal it up. It, the, the idea that there's this opposition <laughs> to, 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 to speak <laughs> rationally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why are we here yeah. of nihilism? There's a, there are many, many uh, justifications for uh, madness have been uh, uh, coming out of that hole. The, this opposition between reason and everything else, I think, is fundamentally spurious. I, I think this, this idea that there's love on the one hand and then the cool rationality of science that's just all clatter and clockwork and soulless, this, this is a false dichotomy, and it's a, it's a dichotomy that is pervasive mm -hmm. in the culture. I, you know, you can't sign, you know, I can't tell you how many times I get on the, on the radio and someone says, scientifically prove to me that you love your wife, mm -hmm. as though that were just the knockdown argument of all time against, you know, against reason and in support of faith. Um, there's nothing irrational in principle about love. I mean, it, it is rational to value love. It is rational to try to, ma to, to recognize that it is one of our uh, uh, most cherished experiences, and, and then to try to, to, to live a life that maximizes it. Understanding love at the level of the brain is not going to deflate its, its importance for us. I um, mean, the fact that we, we can understand the molecular constituents of chocolate doesn't make us not want to eat chocolate. I mean, these are different scales of, of interaction with the world. And um, so it's not a matter of only being coldly calculating in, in our approach to life, but uh, where we have to call a spade a spade is in gratuitous claims to certainty about invisible realities and the moral structures to the, to the universe, about a God who so hates homosexuality that he will whip up tsunamis uh, in defense of, of chaste heterosexual people. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a vision of life that is animating millions and millions of our neighbors, and we have been cowed into not criticizing it. And I mean, to pick up what Pat Churchland said, th this job is not best done by scientists. This is the, I mean, we need, from, from a hundred sides, culture at large to, to just make it fundamentally embarrassing to hold these kinds of certainties. And uh, I don't know if you, you know about how the, the KKK, how it, its stature got so eroded in this, in this country, but there's this, this uh, great little story about uh, this guy Stetson Kennedy who leaked, he, he joined the KKK, and then he leaked all their goofy lingo and secret passwords to the people who were writing the Adventures of Su Superman radio series back in the 40s. And so every week, uh, it was Superman fighting the KKK with all the up-to-the-minute passwords and handshakes and you know bogus, cultish nonsense. And uh, so the, these, these grand wizards would come home, and they would see their kids playing the K you know, KKK versus Superman on the front lawn and with Superman winning and all these, <laughs> the current passwords. And they found this so humiliating, and this was so corrosive, and, and Stetson Kennedy was still, you know, inside the Klan. He would, he would see the, the aftermath of these effects at meetings. Um, and, you know, the, I'm sure there were other, other variables uh, involved, but the KKK is, a f is functionally a, a, a defunct organization, whereas it had 20 million members, among whom were senators and even one president. Um, it's possible to make progress. Uh, and, we, and I think we just have to keep that in view.